Today, we discuss Miro. Today, I want to talk about the hellscape that is technical diagramming, right? Everybody's nodding their heads right now. Uh huh. And there is a potential solution that I want to share. There was one name that several people brought up. I did some digging, and it's kind of nuts how much this program Miro has for developers. I have to share this. It could potentially be a game changer for you. So my favorite part about Miro is that half the work is already done. Like right now, typically we spend hours starting diagrams from scratch, gathering information. You get buy-in from every team. Uh, you know, that's a lot of work to do. But Miro has a full set of integrations with the tools you're probably already using. And they also offer open APIs and SDKs for custom solutions for all those niche diagram use cases we have to do, right? So the end result is the same, but it doesn't take forever. It's a massive, massive time saver. I'm transforming basic flowcharts and network architectures, and it all lives in one place. So are you using Miro? Have you used it? I want to hear. That's M-I-R-O dot com. Bummer, the holidays are over. No more presents. But yay, you have your freedom again. The new year is full of ups and downs, but however you're feeling, you can always be happy with Prime Video. Catch the new season of Reacher. Rent or buy new releases like Taylor Swift's The Eras Tour extended version. You can add on hundreds of streamers. One app, one password. Prime Video. Find your happy place. Restrictions apply. Prime membership not required to rent or buy. See Amazon.com slash Amazon Prime for details. Hello and welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello, everyone. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Harry Swan, a young Irish jockey who is part of a racing dynasty and at the beginning of his riding career. Hello, Harry. Hi, Stephen. Thanks very much uh, for joining me on the paddock and the pavilion. Um, You're certainly part of a racing dynasty. Um, we must mention a few people here, not really bigging these people up, but we've got to mention your dad, who uh, uh nine-time Irish champion jockey, uh, won the champion hurdle three times on Isterbrek. Uh, your granddad, who was also a trainer like your dad, and he rode in the Grand National in 1975. And also your grandmother, Teresa, she is the great-granddaughter of Ellen Challoner, the first woman trainer, whose husband, Tom Challoner, won the derby in 1863 and you were telling me you also related to the hides as well yeah thanks for having me Stephen um yeah it's a big big racing family Stephen uh yeah so my my mother is a hide so my grandfather would be Tim Timmy Hyde um and my uncle would be Tim Hyde so on both sides really I'm um I'm it's all horse racing yeah so was it inevitable that you became a jockey then I think so. I mean, when I was young, I, I I did enjoy, I enjoyed loads of other sports. I played a lot of rugby when I was younger. Um, but I suppose once I finished rugby, it was, it was really the only thing in my mind, really kind of sports wise, you know, I wasn't, I, I didn't really enjoy other sports as, as I did riding horses, you know, um, I suppose. And then obviously, you know, everyone would be saying it to you because you're, your dad and, you know, every, every the whole family really. So uh, I think it was, yeah, I think it was. So how how old were you when you started riding ponies? I, I think I was since the day I could walk, really, Stephen. Um, I mean, I I can't remember the first day I rode a horse because it, you know it's 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 so long ago. But uh, yeah, and no, I was, my my both my parents got me into obviously they I they had me on horses since I was very very young and. I suppose I just I loved it one the, the moment I sat on a horse really. Um and then I I started riding a lot of ponies then. Um, you know, I did a lot of pony club when I was younger. Uh and then I, I gradually kind of went I, I started doing a lot of eventing, um, which I loved. Uh, and I was I suppose like I was I did loads of that. I had a couple of ponies um on the go. My mother was huge, hugely involved in that because, you know, she, she actually was, she used to be a very good event rider, um, when she was riding. But, uh, I suppose I got my, I started doing eventing Ireland, which was kind of the step up from pony club then. And I eventually worked my way up and I actually, I actually, uh, went to European championships, um, eventing for pony eventing. And I actually won a silver medal. So that's kind of how it started really. Um, and kind of when, re- you, and when you were younger, did, because of your dad being so much into, well, he 
he'd retired virtually when you were when you were born yeah. but do you remember having lots of people around the around the house uh, quite famous people because of your dad yeah i did um yeah no i can get a lot of visits um shane Roderick would come a lot uh from he'd visit dad a lot they'd be good friends um had the, the countless names really my dad would be great friends at tony mccoy so I, i'm sure he, he was around there a lot but uh yeah, no, there's a lot of a lot of different visitors around the house and big names in racing. Yeah. And did did your dad put you under any pressure to become a jockey or no, no, none at all. Um I suppose once kind of when I stopped eventing, I, I, I didn't actually want to keep going eventing. I I wanted to ride. I wanted to go racing. And dad said, Look, there's no there's no pressure at all. Look, you whatever you want, you know, he said he be, he he wanted me to go to college and stuff like that, and he said, "Look, ride it, ride as an amateur if you want." But there, there was God, there was no pressure at all. And you know, I I was riding out for when Dad was training. I was riding out, but he retired then. And I suppose once I got my license out, then my amateur license, it, you know, it just worked out that way that he had retired. But um, you know, there was obviously no pressure at all. Yeah. And who were your heroes racing heroes when you were growing up and you and you can't mention your dad yeah uh, no. <laughs> i suppose ruby Walsh. i really looked up to because when i was kind of growing up he was you know he was the main guy really you know um i, I really like enjoyed watching him davy russell as well um and I, I liked watching a lot of amateur nina carberry i think was a, a big influence as well I, I think just you know she was a brilliant rider um, and I actually don't think she gets enough credit really, but, uh, you know, she used to ride for dad a lot. Um, she kind of was her, uh, his amateur jockey. So, you know, it was, I suppose, yeah, I suppose those, those three people really. Yeah. And did you go racing yourself a lot? Yeah, I did. I remember I, I did definitely go with dad a lot. Um, he brought me along to most re- big race readings and it was brilliant. You know, I got to meet a lot of people as well when I was younger with dad so you know to build be able to build contacts like that are, are great from when i was young so no uh i i enjoy i love going racing i think i remember I, I you know it's not actually i don't remember a huge amount because when when dad actually when he stopped training you know it was in 2014 and i i was in first year at the time so i'd be i was in school a lot you know and i couldn't go racing i could only go racing during the summer really before that so i know i i loved it yeah how old were you when you first started riding out? When I first started riding out, I'd say I was 12, I think. 12, when I started riding racehorses, I was around 12 uh, because it was handy because dad was training at the time. So, you know, I could just ride and he put me on the, the quietest horses there really. And, but uh, yeah, I think I'd ride two lots, I think, before I went to school, I remember. Um, yeah, so no, it was good. Yeah, a different way of starting school, isn't it? Riding out before you go to school. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Um, I'd say I was tired coming back after school. <laughs> I need to lie down. I think. And do you remember the the first ride you had in uh, under rules? Yes, I do. Oh God, you you kind of stumped me with the year now, but I remember it was a mare from my grandfather um, called She'll Come On for the Run. Uh, I don't think she ever came on from the run after, but uh, no, she was uh, she was uh, she was my first ride in Goran Park. Uh, I think it was was it twenty seven or was it twenty sixteen? I think uh, the summer, yeah, summer of twenty sixteen. I think, yeah, I was sixteen. Um, I suppose, I suppose when when I first when I had my first ride, it was it was kind of like. I, I think I caught the bug when I when my first ride really because I remember when I stopped the venting and I went racing I wasn't um, it wasn't like I was mad for horse racing you know I did want to do it but it wasn't like as if I was mad but I think when I had my first ride it just really I really got to me um, I think I just completely fell in love with the sport really um, and then I, I rode her a couple more times then uh, just to get me experience just to get experience and yeah, she was she was a she was a lovely mare now to be to get me going. Yeah. So were these flat races as well? Yeah, all bumpers. So bumpers, yeah. I think I rode her in four or five bumpers. Um and then 
Yeah, and then I think I rode a horse in Down Royal called uh, Stacy Sue, which my cousin had actually won on. Um, I rode on her. I got she was second, I think, in Down Royal, and then they brought we brought her over to Worcester, and I rode my first winner in Worcester. Then um, later, I think it was twenty seventeen. Then uh, by twenty eighteen, my research said twenty eighteen. I, I know you better than yourself, and you're. <laughs> yeah, I, can, I, I can excuse people like Richard Pittman. They're, they're nearly eighty, but you're. You're yeah. early twenty, so yeah. It was um, your first winner was on the seventeenth of September, two thousand and eighteen. Yeah, and yeah. you were sixteen. I was sixteen. I looked up. Your dad was fifteen when he won his first yeah. his first race, so he beat yeah. you. He beat me. I think he rode a one for his father. I think in Nace. I think it was a five for a long sprint in Nace. That was his first winner. Um, so yeah, <laughs> and you also won on your first hurdle race as well, didn't you? I did. I did. I rode a, a lovely a horse called On Eagle's Wings. He actually, I think, gave me ex- loads of experience because he, he actually, he was a very nice horse. Uh, he won a maiden hurdle in Nace, actually. And he, and then we went to Down Royal with him, uh, in a, in a listed race and he was fourth, I think. Um, and then, and then he won in, uh, grade three in Nace again. So, you know, to get my first graded winner, my first hurdle winner and my first graded winner on that horse, you know, he was a brilliant, brilliant horse. Yeah. Yeah. And in that graded grade three race that you won, you had the like of Rachel Blackmore in the race as well. Yeah. Rachel Blackmore. I think Dennis O'Regan. Uh, I think I just got him, got him within 50 yards. So I don't think he was too happy, but yeah. But uh, no, it was brilliant, brilliant day for the family as well. You know, Timmy, Timmy was brilliant with like my grandfather and you know he, he's he got me going really you know if it wasn't for him I wouldn't I, I'd say I wouldn't have even started racing because I wouldn't have got those rides easier you know uh, and just as he gave me so much experience you know uh, so it's brilliant yeah and you've also written a lot for Gordon Elliott as well what's it like riding for him yeah um, I'm sure Gordon has been Gordon has been brilliant really uh, like he's given me so much um you know, he's he given me so many opportunities, especially especially on on good horses. You know, horses that are expensive horses. You know, which there is there is a bit of pressure on those rides, but you know, for him to have the confidence in you, I think is uh, you know, is you know, helps you out a lot, and you know, it's you reflect on it. You you know, you're you're you think you're you well, you kind of think in your head like you know, you're I think. If he's putting you up on horses, then you must be all right, you know. So it's good confidence, yeah. And one of those horses was uh, Fakir Delane that came fourth in the Kim uh, at the Cheltenham Festival. Yeah. yeah. What was uh, it like? What was the atmosphere and what was it like riding at the festival? Was it something you'd never experienced before? Yeah, it was unbelievable. Um, oh, it's different than anything I've ever experienced, really. I, I, uh, I had my first ride that day. Actually, I had two rides that day in Cheltenham. My first ride in Cheltenham was uh, Dallas to Picton in the Pretemps. Um, I think he finished. I think he fit mid mid division or something. He ran all right, uh, but I remember jumping the first. Nearly fell at the first hurdle there, so that was a bit of a scare. But. Uh, yeah, like in Gordon and Jiggin Jiggin Center have been brilliant for my career as well. You know, they've given me a couple of winners and you know, my first ride in Cheltenham. So and then obviously I rode Fakir de Len later that day in the Kim Yor and he finished fourth, which was a pretty brilliant result, you know. I think it, like he was probably the outsider of all of Gordon's horses and he, he finished in front of all of them. So yeah, it was brilliant, brilliant day. Yeah, you came fourth of, of twenty that day, and then you rode the same horse in the Irish Grand National. Yeah, I wrote. I, I Gordon was like, I was delighted to get the opportunity to ride in the in the national. Like you know, it's you know a lot of people, especially an amateur at that age. You know, very little. You know, you know a lot of jockeys wouldn't get that opportunity, and to even just to ride in the Grand National like was a serious confidence boost as well. But you know, I suppose how it turned out wasn't great, but. At least, you know, I got the right, I, I fell I fell at the first, got brought down at the first actually by another one of Gordon's horses. So, you know, that's just how it works out sometimes. Um, horse racing is very unpredictable. But uh, yeah, but look, I it was brilliant. Just to get the opportunities is, is amazing, yeah. 
So all good experience. And we were talking off air. What's the plan? Because you're also uh, at college as well at the moment and riding as an amateur, aren't you? Yeah. So I'm I'm in I'm in Trinity College. Uh, I was doing uh, biological and biomedical science. So I've specialised in environmental science. So look, I mean, I look, I love college. I enjoy it. Um, you know, college life is nice. It's it's fun. Uh, but also, it's also tough. You know, exams are tough. But uh, no, I do, I do enjoy college, and the course I'm doing is is difficult, but I do enjoy it. Um, I suppose as well, riding on the side. It's hard to juggle the two of them, but uh, I can do it. I'm managing, you know, because uh, I would be very busy with riding as well. So. Uh, just to manage the two of them is is a difficult task, but I I can do up till now. I, I've been doing it okay, yeah. And how far are you with your college course? Is it your third year, second year? Yeah, I'm in third year, third year. Uh, so I've this year and next year left. So we'll finish that to get that finished definitely anyway. And in a way, does going to college relax you when you actually go out riding? You've got two things to think about. It's not all pressure on riding. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. You know, uh, it's not, you kind of, you know, if you're a professional, it's all horse racing, you know, it's, there's nothing, you kind of don't have another life, but it's, it's all in horse racing. But I feel in college, you can kind of get away from the kind of that side. Um, and I just think, you know, college life is good. It's fun. It's, and you meet loads of people. Um, and then you can go back to your horse racing as well when you're riding. And like, it's kind of, I kind of live in two lives, if you know what I mean, um, at the minute. But, you know, I don't mind it. I, it's just busy, but, you know, it's good to be busy. And are you able to ride out most days? Yeah, I, I, not, not, I get to ride out maybe two or three times a week because obviously I, ca- I can't miss a lot of, a lot of college. Um, catching up is a very hard thing to do in college. So, uh, I think, yeah, two or three times a week is grand. It's fine, you know. Uh, it keeps me fit. I go to the gym a lot as well, just to keep keep me ticking over, really. Um, so yeah, yeah. So, will decisions have to be made when you finish college? Yeah, look, I haven't. I need to discuss it further with uh with family, my my dad and my parents, really. But uh, I've I thought about it myself, and it's something that. You know, it's 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 very hard to be a full time professional jockey if you're not in the top. You know, you have to be up in the top tens uh, in in Ireland to be making very good money. You know, um, and I suppose with my degree behind me, it's I suppose it's you know to get a job. It's it's quite easier to get a job like that. You know, you can be making easier money and you know injuries when you're riding as a professional is tough like you know and it it all gets to you but look it's something I haven't I need to think about more really you know my parents and stuff like that so yeah I'll see I'll see what the plan is for the future yeah well so far you've had five hurdle wins one chase win and 14 uh, bumper wins are you getting more rides now over hurdles and over uh, fences yeah is that the plan See that is the plan, but as an amateur, you can you only have twenty one rides in a season. So I'm actually I'm I've actually had fifteen rides this season so far. So I can't. I'm trying to judge. I'm trying to only ride in the big races as such. You know the big handicap races. Um, like I I, I wouldn't I wouldn't ride if it wasn't uh you know if the horse didn't have a, a very good chance or if it wasn't a, a big race because you know you just have to manage your rides that way. Because uh, you, you have to get 21 rides to last you to the end of the season. So I have five more rides left at the end of the season. And, you know, I'll probably be busy over Christmas and hopefully I pick up a few good rides and big handicaps, you know. And will you be hoping to get some rides again at Cheltenham in 2023? Yeah, that's the plan anyway. Um, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, yeah, like, it, you know, it'd be brilliant to ride in the Kim Yor again of the Fox Hunters. And, you know, even if I... I, I think I have uh, I have three rides left, my cl- three winners left in my seven round claim. So, you know, if they could, if I could last that out till Cheltenham, and maybe I don't think professional rides don't actually count over there towards your amateur rides in Ireland. So, you know, hopefully I could have a few professional rides over there. Maybe It'd be fantastic to get a ride at Aintree as well, if possible. Yeah, I mean the Fox, which is something I'd love. It's, it's a race I re- I'd love to ride in. You know, 
uh, especially over those fences. Because uh, I do, I love riding over fences. And, you know, as an amateur, you don't get to ride, unless you're point to point, but you don't get to ride on the track over fences as much as you would, you know, if you're a professional. So especially to ride over those fences would be amazing. Yeah. And as an Irishman, can Honeysickle beat Constitution Hill? Look, I'm hoping, I'm hoping she can. It's it's definitely going to be a very tough task. I think, he, you know, his timing, I think just Constitution Hill, like, he just looks a bit of a freak, to be honest, you know. Um, like, and then there's debate that Honeysuckle might go for the mayor's hurdle as well. So, you know, it's hard to know. Um, but, you know, Honeysuckle, you know, she might... I, I, I think for Honeysuckle, I think she needs a horse to battle with, you know, and Constitution Hill could do that as well uh, with her. So I think she really, yeah, no, I think I think she'll, she, she'll have a chance, but I just, it will, it will be a very hard task. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Harry, for joining me today on the Paddock and the Pavilion. Um, a very Merry Christmas to you and uh, best wishes for the new year, for your riding career and for those exams. Are they in June? I have exactly exams tomorrow and Friday. So, yeah, <laughs> busy. I have to go back studying now after this. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Pad and Pad. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. Vernon, 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 the heating and cooling specialist. The name says it all. When you focus solely on indoor comfort for 43 years, well, you get really good at it. Get your heating or cooling system tuned by a Vernon specialist today for only $69. Vernon's 60 to 90 minutes of meticulous system inspection guarantees energy savings or the tune-up is free. Now that's a value. Go to vernonheating.com. Vernon.